speech pub, during the public input process, there's little forms at the front that you just need to fill out. We're all going to get started in about three minutes here, so if you can find your way, we'll uh, get rolling shortly. Uh, this will be live streamed on the Monona Community Media YouTube channel as well and recorded, so at any time you can go back and view it. Just raise it in the air and I'll come and get it picked up. We're going to try to start in two minutes. Uh, steering committee members and council that are here, uh, we'll have them sit to view the presentation and an introduction from the mayor happening shortly. Uh, and then when we get to the point of public input, um, I will call your name. You'll have three minutes to provide input and opinion uh, to our steering committee and members of our city council that are here. Uh, you are welcome at any time to go out in the lobby in the uh, cafeteria and um, provide input on the sticky notes or look at some of the documentation that's out there as well. Yes, you'll talk right here when you come up.
people a couple more minutes to get seated. If everyone would like to grab a seat, we're going to get started. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Monona Mayor Mary O'Connor, and I'd like to welcome you to our first San Damiano Community Information Meeting. In September of 2021, the Monona City Council made a unanimous decision to purchase the historic San Damiano property, something that many Monona residents had dreamed of for years. Since that time, the city has been working towards initiating a master planning process for the property, one that would involve input from the entire community. A couple of things had to happen before we could start. The Friends of San Damiano was formed and committed to raise the funds to pay for the planning process. They've achieved their goal of $143,000 earlier this year, and they continue to fundraise to defray the cost of the purchase and maintenance of the property. In the meantime, the city established a San Damiano Steering Committee, approved by the City Council and co-chaired by myself and Friends President Andrew Kitzlar, to help lead the master planning process. Several Steering Committee members are here tonight, and I'd like to introduce them. If you folks would just stand when I call your name. Wes Mossman Black who's the Friends Vice President and Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Wisconsin Historical Society, Alder Nancy Moore, Friends Board Member, Alder Doug Wood, Parks Board Chair, Mary Lee Gorman, former President of the Clean Lakes Alliance, and Rebecca Holmquist, member of the Monona Landmarks Committee. Friends President Andrew Kitzlar and Kyla Beard, who represents the Ho-Chunk Nation, were not able to join us tonight due to other commitments. Monona Grove School Board President Lorreen Gage and local businesswoman and Parks Board member Kelly Slack recently stepped down from the committee due to other obligations, but they've been quite involved up to now. <clears throat> the committee has provided their input on the planning process and helped with the search for a consulting firm to facilitate the process. Earlier this year, after conducting a series of interviews, they recommended the city hire MSA Professional Services. The City Council approved an agreement with MSA early this past summer. We expect the process to run about 18 months through 2023. At that time, the recommendations will be submitted to the Monona City Council, which has the final say on whatever happens with the property. Any improvements that happen as a result of the plan will have to be fundraised for, something the Friends of San Damiano have committed to doing. So before closing, I'd like to make some thank yous. Um, first of all, to the residents of Monona and the Madison area who have been so supportive of the purchase. I can't tell you the number of people who have come up to me so excited about the fact that Monona has purchased the San Damiano property. Dane County, which gave us a $2 million conservation grant. The Wisconsin DNR, which awarded us a $249,000 Knowles Nelson grant. The Friends of San Damiano for their support of the master planning process, all the activities they've planned and supported at the site, including numerous tours of the house and grounds, all the historical information they've gathered, their newsletter, website, Facebook posts, and everything else they've done to help us spread the word about San Damiano. Ho-Chunk tribal historian Bill Quackenbush and other members of the tribe who've provided their insights and knowledge of the time the Ho-Chunk Nation spent on the property, and everyone else who's com contributed their time, talents, and money to the property. Then on the city side, I'd like to thank the members of the steering committee, the Monona City Council, including those members who stepped down earlier this year, former city administrator Brian Gatto, finance director and interim administrator Mark Hotaker, community media director Will Nimau, director of planning and community development Doug Plowman, and last but not least, Monona Parks director Jake Anderson and his staff, who among other things have taken over ongoing maintenance of the property as well as spearheading three very successful beer gardens we held over the summer. And I'm sure some of you were there. So let's give them all a hand.
Now I'd like to turn the mic over to Dan Williams of MSA, who will bring us up to date about the master planning process and what's happened so far. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I told the mayor I'm a walker, so bear with me. I'm going to try and stay at the podium. Um, my name is Dan Williams. I'm a landscape architect with MSA. Um, and tonight, uh, Dan Schmidt and Hannah Kramer are with me. They're also landscape architects. As the mayor mentioned, um, this is a master plan. So we're, all we're doing at this point in time is planning what could be in the park um, someday. We're very thrilled to be um, the firm that was chosen to work on the project. We're here in Madison. Um, I'm actually a sailor. I have a flying Scott. I used to have it in the uh, uh, Monona. Uh, Lake Monona Sailing Club, so I'm very familiar with the site. It was, we talked with people when we're out on the site and a lot of people had the same feelings that I had. I was always scared to go on the property because I didn't think you could go there, you know, with the, with all the, um, it not being a public space. So it's pretty awesome, I think, that you were able to get the property. So let, bear with me, I'm trying to get this to work. So this is our, our core team that's working on the project. Um, Rain Gardner uh, is actually uh, Dan and uh, Hannah and my team leader. She's a civil engineer, um, and she's also the head of the Park and Rec team at MSA. So she, her passion is parks and and water and waterfronts. Um, and of course, there's Dan and Hannah, and then my wife Brenda is uh, the principal and director of preservation planning at Quinn Evans Architects. Uh, Quinn Evans is a national firm, and they specialize in preservation architecture. So we teamed with them um, for the house to take a look at the, uh, the Alice house, as well as Brenda is a landscape architect and she um, specializes in cultural landscapes. So we've worked a lot with Native um, Americans and tribes throughout the United States. And um, in fact, Bill Quack Quackenbush is a good friend of ours. He's inheriting my flying Scott. So. <laughs> And then Alex, Alexis Cecil is a um, architect. So Brenda is more on the cultural and historic side of the site, and Alexis is the architect that's been looking at the house. Um, we were able to go out this summer and fly. We have um, drone pilots at MSA, so we uh, take a lot of aerial photos of our site. So we were able to go out this um, summer. And, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we were able to go out this summer and take um, aerial photos and videos of the site to use in the planning effort. Um, we've also started what's called a story map. So it's an interactive, it's kind of like a web page, but it, uh, it's a little bit more interactive than a web page. There's a QR code up on the screen. Um, if you have your phone with you, you can download the, the site. It's open 24 hours a day. It's a living site, so as we move through this 18-month process, we'll continue to put information about the project on the story map. Very easy to use. You don't have to go in and out and click different things. It's, you'll, you'll just be able to stream through it and understand what you're looking at. There's photographs. We'll start putting plans when we get to that point in the project. Um, there's a schedule, some history. There's, there's a lot of things already on the story map. As the mayor mentioned, it's an 18-month process. We're in um, what we call phase one, which is the orange on the graph. That's the um, found, what we call foundation, so it's fact-finding. So we've done a lot of work to date finding out more about the site, the history of the site, um, the, what's on the site today, the, the vegetation, the topography. You see some boards outside in the hallway. You can see some of the stuff that we started to gather. gather. Also a part of the foundation is to interview people or talk with people through surveying and out on the site. And that's why you're here tonight. This is the first public information meeting to talk to you about the project and some of the desires that might be there for the project. As well as we're going to talk a little bit here in a minute about the survey um, that was just um, uh, uh, closed down to uh, get the initial thinking about the park started with the community. Then at the um, beginning of November, we'll start moving into phase two, which is concepting. So that's where we start to put pen to paper and put some of your ideas on, on the paper, on a plan. So um, in January, February of 2023, we'll present those uh, concepts in a public meeting. 
and get your feedback. And so the, the concepts aren't all going to be perfect. And um, the reason that we do that is so that we can get your response of to what you like and what you don't like. But all the designs will be based on what we're hearing from the community. And then finally, in <clears throat> March of 2023, we'll start moving into the final master plan portion of the project where we develop a comprehensive plan that you can carry forward with phases, cost, those sorts of things. But you have to keep in mind, this is just a master plan. This is not um, construction documents. This is not going to build anything. This is just giving you a roadmap to the future on how what you might build in the park. And we all know parks take 10, 20, 30 years to reach full fruition. So keep that in mind. This is a master plan. There's a board. Um, out front as well, if you want to look at it in more detail. It's a history board that was put together by the students at U University of Wisconsin Landscape Architecture Department. Um, Hannah was in the group that did uh, the project. They did a um, junior uh, level course at looking at San Damiano property as a park. So that's out there. Um, the city has the three teams um, proposals that they had for the park. So it's pretty interesting to look at. We've started to look at um, how you arrive to the park, how you might, we've asked that question. Do you come by car? Do you come by bicycle? Do you come by bus? So we're starting to look at how the park is used from outside the park itself so that we can build interest in maybe uh, adjusting the bus route, for instance, and talking to um, uh, Metro or whoever to get the buses closer to the park or bicycle paths closer to the park. So we look at areas around the park just to start to think about that. And again, we have uh, quite a few aerial drone photos of the site. Um, we're, uh, we have a transportation planner on our team that's going to look at the, uh, any type of entrance and exit that might be proposed any different than the driveway so that you're um, making, we're making sure that we're compliant with vision triangle so people can get out of the site safely because we know it's on a bend of Monona Drive and, it's, and Monona Drive is pretty hectic sometimes. Um, we've got, we have some great photos of Holy Bay. Um, we, we originally were going to do the aerial photos in one of the beer gardens, but um, there was an issue with putting the drone up with all the people underneath of it. But it would be nice to see the boats in the water sometime when you have a bunch of people out in front of the property. But we do have some photos from the shoreline looking at all the boats, um, so we have a good idea of how many people could be coming from the, the water side to the park. Of course, we have uh, a lot of photos of the house from the exterior. The city um, hired a professional photographer to take pictures of the inside of the building. And if you haven't gone onto the city web website, it's virtual. You can go through the house. Um, it's pretty interesting, and it's, and it's pretty true to what the house looks like inside if you haven't been inside. Um, there are opportunities and uh, challenges that we're starting to record on site. You have some features that were built over time that might need to be um, adjusted a little bit so that you uh, you provide safe access for everyone in the park. Um, we've started to uh, uh, coordinate with the DNR and some of the agencies on what would be good approaches and what would be bad approaches from their perspective. So when you move into the phases of the project after this master plan, you know you're step, starting off on the right foot. You're not going to do something that federal, uh, the agencies are going to say, no, we're not going to permit that. Um, we started, uh, we did a tree survey, and actually Dan and Hannah did the survey. And what we do is we have a, a thing on our cell phones. It's called Collector App. Uh, they're able to walk around the site and, and identify the trees exactly where they are. And since we're landscape architects, we can identify the species of the trees. They measured the diameter and if you go out to the park you'll see a little metal ring, a little metal tab on the trees. They're all numbered and so uh, Jake has all that information in the city's GIS form now so 
you can see we we can break it down by species. We can break it down by trees not to plant, trees that are dead. So that helps us in the planning process to identify trees that um, might, you know, if you have a, say for instance, you put a walk in or something and there's a tree there and it gets cut down and people are, would come back and say, why did you cut that tree down? Um, we don't purposely put walks where good living trees are. It might be a tree that's in red in this instance where it's already dead or it's on, on a significant decay. So the tree survey is very important to our, our planning and what we do. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan and he's going to go through the survey. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm Dan Schmidt, landscape architect with MSA. Work alongside Dan and our team on the planning projects um, that we get to work on, so working on great spaces um, like San Damiano. As Dan mentioned, um, there's a numerous ways we're conducting outreach um, in addition to meetings like this um, with the public. Um, the first of which was an online survey that was ran during one of the brew gardens um, in July. It got a total of 72 responses and was just to get a kind of flavor for what some of the um, early feelings or understandings of the site were. Um, some of the things that came out of that, the common themes, we're making minor changes to the site, um, accessibility improvements, yet retaining um, the current, yep, retaining the current status as a peaceful space where people can engage, um, installing signage and monuments, um, improving facilities in the property, and um, looking at public docks and piers. Um, so from that summary, 64% lived in Monona, 72% visited San Damiano within the last six months prior to the event, and 81% had not been on a tour of the Frank Alice House at that time. So going into our more current outreach, um, from the beginning of October through um, Saturday, we had an online survey running. Um, was distributed through the entire 53716 zip code via mailers, as well as outreach by um, the city through social media and emails. Um, there were 1,620 responses. Um, of that, uh, 1,038 were city of Monona residents. Uh, so with a population of 800 or 8,700, we had about a 12% response rate, which um, for a community is, is pretty good. Um, the full results of that survey are available upon request um, through the city if you would like to read all couple hundred pages of the results and comments. So the first couple questions we asked were just demographics, just to understand who was responding to the survey. And that helps kind of break down things like, are they Monona residents, Madison residents, they live other places, the age. Um, majority um, were between 40 and 50 or 60 and older, um, generally falling within kind of the, the demographics of the city of Monona. Um, heavily white or Caucasian. Um, and as we move through the planning process, um, working with the steering committee, we'll be identifying focus groups to help kind of broaden that outreach to make sure that we're getting um, as good and wide of a swath of public input as we can. Um, but most were not Hispanic or Latino. Um, the respondents' uh, household income was a little higher than the median, on average, between 100 and 150,000. And a, um, about 40% had children living at home under the age of 18, and about 60% did not. And kind of similar breakdown, um, about 25% had an adult over 65 and 70% did not. As I mentioned, we had 1,000 of the 1,600 responses were residents of the city of Monona. Um, so about 300 from the city of Madison and then a few from other Dane County areas. So one of the questions was asking um, familiarity with the property. So understanding what people know or how they um, understand the property. Highest level, um, either had driven past or visited the property. Um, I think particularly this season with outreach of the beer gardens and other um, events um, since the park has become public. Um, 
about 382 of the respondents had toured the home uh, through the numerous tours that were offered this summer. Um, and others were following via the websites, local press, um, and other developments on social media. And um, there were a good number who knew some of the history of the site previously. Not unsurprisingly, um, when looking at how people are getting to um, the property, majority is by car or walking and biking. Um, there are limited transit options, um, and given access, boating is still minimal. But certainly, as Dan mentioned, one of the potential opportunities as the site is um, improved or developed. We asked what values or guiding principles um, the respondents best felt um, about San Damio and its future, um, and trying to understand what people feel importance of the site um, and how to start to bring that into the concepts that will be developed. Uh, the natural and scenic beauty of the site itself, so the trees, the lakeshore views, um, ranked the highest. And then coming down, the peace and serenity, appreciation of the property's diverse history. Um, so starting back with the Native American history, going into its more current history and, and now modern history. And then uh, fostering community connections and engagement. Um, so being able to put on events like the beer gardens and other things that can get the community together on the site and activate um, a great piece of lakeshore within the community. Um, we asked how important Frank Alice House was in overall context and appreciation. Um, it was kind of split between people having some importance and not much importance. 20% um, did feel that the house is very important to the site. Um, so that will all be brought into the planning process as we start to look at the future of the house, what its potential uses could be if it's kept, and what are the opportunities or um, constraints um, if it's either modified or removed and another structure built. Looking at overall support um, of making changes to the site. So we asked questions earlier about what people felt um, was important and interesting, but also looking at um, the strong majority to do feel that some changes um, are okay, um, that some of the history is important to, to monitor and, and embrace, but the site doesn't function maybe to its highest potential, and there is interest or, or openness to those discussions as we go through this process, and that's really what the planning process is, is looking to answer, what, what are those uses. Uh, question 18 was looking at a number of different potential uses, um, not meant to be kind of a, an overall list that's defined, but we put together a number of items of things that could fit the space. Um, highest ranking um, of importance for individuals were pedestrian and bike trails, bird and wildlife viewing, uh, contemplative or mem meditation spaces, um, and access to the water such as canoe and kayak launches, and um, some type of, of play areas or um, recreation space, uh, but more passive. And there were a number of questions that allowed open answers, uh, which are a little bit harder to quantify, and we're still digging through some of that data with the survey closing, uh, but looking at some of the ideas that came out um, that received a few more mentions than others were things like a disc golf course, dedicated space for outdoor fitness classes, um, dog-friendly swimming area, natural labyrinth, outdoor learning areas, natural play, um, and more passive things like reading nooks or, or chairs and other site furnishings that allow people to kind of passively interact with the space. And then looking too at what, what does the site function and what could be some of the overall program um, aspects to the site. So not just the facilities that are built, but what are the functions of the site. Um, highest ranking there were outdoor picnic area and additional seating, park shelter with permanent restrooms, um, historical monuments or signage, intermittent dining, so something like a pop-up event, food trucks, and infrastructure that allows for those type of events to happen. And then event space for community use. So whether that's open space during the summer or more permanent space that would allow for four season use uh, were some of the top ideas. And then starting to look at what things that maybe weren't mentioned um, and looking at indoor um, learning community spaces, so whether it's classrooms or being able to engage um, youth or training programs, um, bar, restaurant, or coffee shop of some type, hotels, um, lakefront development similar to the Memorial Union Terrace, dedicated space for weddings, 
and um, B cycle stations for access. So being able to integrate uh, connections to the rest of the community and, and broader Madison area. And then one of the questions, just an open-ended piece of, of some of the general comments um, that people had about the property and things that could be considered during the planning process. Um, parking concerns certainly came up, um, given there's just a number of stalls on the site now, but also how does that relate to, to overall use and land use within the site? And desire to preserve the quiet, natural experiences of the site, so that passive outdoor space, um, kind of contemplative areas and views. Um, looking at maybe renaming this property um, to honor its Ho-Chunk history or some other um, character, which is something that certainly can be discussed. And desire to preserve views of the lakes, certainly one of the site's greatest assets. Um, and looking to improve overall accessibility, which is not only a requirement for law, but also just a great way to provide the broadest use possible within the community. And looking at planting more native trees, grasses, wildflowers. As Dan mentioned, we did a tree survey um, and while there are a lot of trees on site, a good chunk of them are Norway maples um, or have um, pretty significant um, structural flaws. So a number of the trees, while they're, they're beautiful and large and as a landscape architect we'd love to keep, um, may not necessarily be structural for the long term. So that would be certainly something that's discussed as the planning process and overall management of the site moves forward to making sure that um, users and site is safe um, as well as maintainable. So with that, I will turn it back over to Dan to kind of go through the next steps in the process and get us in uh, some public comment. Okay, now we're to the, oh, sorry about that. Now we're to the um, public comment period. Uh, Jake has some uh, cards that are already filled out, but before he um, gets to that, there are, when you first came in the, in the round tables, there are some plans or aerial photos on the tables and then there's a, two questions and post-it notes. So at any time during this portion of the uh, question and comment period, feel free to get up, go outside, look at things, make some comments. You can either leave post-it notes on the aerial photo of areas of the land that you want to see something happen to or just put post and notes on the questions and a answer the questions. So again, feel free to do that at any time. And we'll, uh, Dan or Hannah or myself will be kind of milling out there too to help if anybody has any questions. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jake. All right, so if anyone did not get their form in but would like to speak, they have them all front, just bring them on up to here. I'll call your name. We are going to try to stick to three minutes a person because we have a fair amount of people that would like to speak. I'd ask the steering committee to take the stage because we are here as a committee to listen to you guys tonight on top of what was uh, presented in the survey. This committee meets has been meeting monthly, the third Tuesday of each month. Uh, at the end of the night, we'll get into kind of next steps, but our next scheduled meeting is uh, Tuesday, November 4th. 15th, I believe, but that'll be on the city website, mymonona.com. Uh, if most of you have found the information from there, there's also a, a notify me for San Damiano on the website that you can uh, sign up for to get notifications. Follow at Monona Parks Rec on Facebook or hear the city uh, e news guide. So there's lots of ways to stay informed of the process, uh, but the people here on this committee uh, are the ones that will be deciphering all the information and working through the next steps of this process. So, first up, uh, Lindsay Wood Davis. Oh, and three minutes and I'll be clocking you. Watching closely. <laughs> Let's get this up. Let's try that. Oh, now, can I do this this way and this way? Let me try to do that, because this is for both of them. I, maybe. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Lindsay Wood Davis. Uh, my wife Amanda and I have lived at Reagan Terrace since 2019. But for the previous 22 years, we raised our family in our home on McKenna Road next to the Methodist Church, where Wes and his family now live. When we first moved to town, though, we rented a home right across the street from the San Damiano Friary. 
And as neighbors and dog walkers and new members of Immaculate Heart of Mary, we met the Capuchin Franciscans. And uh, soon, Father Leo was giving me a tour of the house from top to bottom. He wanted to get some recruits to help him make, as he said, make the place a little more livable. It was an overwhelming project. I relate this history and experience to preface my three minutes of remarks. I will, Jake, hold to that. I'll make three points. The Frank Alice House, the land itself, and the future. Each of my points are sure to make some of you mad. One, any thoughts of preserving, restoring, or keeping in any imaginable form the derelict Frank Alice House is madness. We owe six million dollars for the we owe six million dollars for the entire purchase of the property. Making the house ADA compliant could cost as much as we already owe on the purchase alone. It will be hard for many of you, but please erase this distraction from your minds. The house should go. Two, there are still those who continue to pound the drum for the idea of somehow dividing the land, using the proceeds to pay some of the city's purchase price and developing the rest. First off, if we did this, we'd have to return the two million that the county has given us in support of a place of public access. Second, our descendants would haunt our graves forever if we missed the opportunity to save this magic place in its entirety this train's left the station. Let's get on with it. The future. There is no more important phase in this project than the famous plan your work and work your plan. This is going to take strong, visionary leadership, powerful communication, and a real stomach for moving the project along to completion. That's just how it was done with Woodland Park, the Dream Park, and with WVMO. It's how it must be done here. Let's not allow ourselves to be infected by the Madison ability to talk everything to death and never reach a conclusion. There's no other opportunity like this, nor will there ever likely be. Deepest thanks to those who have finally moved us to this meeting tonight. We can do this. Let's get on with it. Thank you so very much. Next up, Judy Capel. Judy Capel. Thank you, Bishop. Hi. Uh, my name is Judy Keppel, and along with my colleagues, I worked at San Damiano for 23 years as the director of the Center for Life and Loss Integration, which was a grief counseling center there. And the priests made us feel incredibly welcome, and I so loved every morning when I came to work driving down that driveway to this beautiful place and to this old quirky house, which I really loved. But today, however, I'm strongly suggesting that the house be taken down and the land it is on be restored to its natural beauty so that the park here could remain as natural and peaceful as it is and as possible with yes, meaningful improvements for the enjoyment and the comfort of those who come. But my most fervent hope is that in place of the house, there could be a small cultural awareness center where the stories of the native people who were here centuries of years before we were could be told with sensitivity and integrity. The stories of the way of life of their people, their reverence for the land, their medicine, their native spirituality, and their allegiance of gratitude for all living creatures. But equally important would be the story of the taking, of the removal of the tribe, the broken treaties, the broken promises, and the trail of tears. If this could be done, I believe that this land then, in part, could honor those who came before us so that San Damiano could continue its long tradition of a place of holiness and peace and healing. I just want to say I'm so thankful for the sensitivity of the Friends of San Damiano and the Monona Parks Department 
for already honoring some of the customs and the activities of Ho-Chunk people with the snow snake, snow snake games and the planting of the Ho-Chunk corn and the dugout canoes and, and the seeking the advisement of the historians of the Ho-Chunk people and the representation of the Ho-Chunk Nation on the steering committee. Thank you so much for your work and your cordial welcome of the ideas of those of us who are so interested. I might just want to say too, one more thing. I would hope that this would, that this would not be just a part of a timeline of who was here and when were they here, because I think it's much more profound than that. So thank you so much. Shane Fry, Shane. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all the initial work on this project. Uh, my name is Shane Fry. My wife and I live on Winnicott Trail um, and have for the last uh, seven years. Prior to that, we were over on Bartles, so we've been here for a while. Um, my wife and I love the purchase of this property and the opportunity that that affords Monona. Uh, but we also have to face the realities of what comes with a project like this. Uh, I'm an architect. I own Brown House, which is an architecture and interior design firm here in Madison. And I believe that the main concern with the property is the fiscal responsibility and the burden that this may place on the Monona residents. This is a large property, and with that comes construction and ongoing maintenance. Um, it's my understanding that Monona is in a budget shortfall right now. We're talking about cutting amenities. Uh, our property taxes went up over 13% this year. Um, and I understand that part of this was purchased with a conservation grant. So I can't speak to exactly uh, what is allowed and what is not allowed on the property. But to make this work without further burdening Monona's residents, it's going to need to be self-supporting. So uh, I've been directly involved with many of the projects like this over the many years uh, in communities around the area. and. So I look at this and I say, the only way that this is going to work is if it's self-supporting financially. So that whether that's an RFP, whether that is some sort of private public ventureship, maybe I'll be haunted, I don't know. Um, but I think that you know, these kind of things can work. And I've seen it work over the, over the course of many years. So I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Peter Kuzma. Hello, um, I've lived in Monona uh, since 2003 and very close proximity to the park. Um, we've been lucky to know the friars that lived there prior to its uh, purchase. I didn't prepare any um, any statements to the degree that the previous speakers did, and I appreciate very much their input. Some really beautiful things were said. I'm just going to comment on a couple of things that I um, also not anticipating the level of detail that was provided tonight. It was really good to see that, and I, I'm interested in looking more into it. A few things that I'd like to mention is that on canoe trips past the property on the lake, um, putting in my canoe at Stonebridge Park and traveling past um, and back again. Something that I had noticed and that I would love to see preserved in some way is that over the past 80 plus years that the property had not been developed and no drainage or sewer lines or um, gutters had been put through the property to the lake, the quality of the water as you canoe from the areas past all of the residences and then past the Santa Mayano property changes markedly. It is suddenly clear. And we're not getting runoff from the true green Camuan life of suburban home lawns draining into the lake directly, which contributes to a lot of people coming and deciding to moor their boats um, and blast really loud music uh, a lot of summer days. But the, the quality of the water immediately in front of that is really quite amazing and it's clear and it's beautiful in part because there has not been um, uh, street drainage and lawn drainage into the, into the lake 
across that entire property. Um, the, um, the opportunity, though, to have better bike access, I think, is going to be something that will be a challenge, but will be necessary and will be very helpful. Uh, over the past 18 years, living um, on Winnicott Road and seeing all of the fun runs and all of the bike events and everything going past it, the number of bikers that we've heard calling to one another as they say, oh wait, just down here, I bet it cuts through, and then turning down the little outlot um, on, on Winnicott Place, I don't know what that little outlot is called, they assume that it goes through and, and it doesn't. Um, the, the last thing that I would simply say is that um, being able to ensure that any building that does happen with regard to bathrooms, with regard to shelters, with regard to something, is able to be thought through in a constructive and perhaps an, an innovative way. The park structures that currently exist at Fireman's Park and Schluter Beach and a lot of our existing parks that serve the purpose of sort of standard like picnic shelter, got to have the flat concrete pad for the picnic tables to go on, got to have the, you know, the, the plumb bathrooms. Those sorts of amenities, while making things accessible and very good, the, um, the idea that a design could be created that would allow for a more cohesive environment that allows for the natural setting and perhaps reflects the history pre um, Frank Ellis House would, would be very much appreciated. And the last thing I'm just going to say is being able to come up with a name that reflects the more extended history of the property would be greatly appreciated. The San Damiano Friary existed probably only since the um, shift from the, um, the, the seminary that was there. And prior to that, um, it, was, it was a private residence. The fact that Winnequa Park um, was one of the last uh, places where there was uh, native encampments um, and that land was taken from the natives in part, the, I believe the White Horse family was, was among the, the residents there, Annie Greencrow White Horse, and that land was turned into a dump and then was since turned into a landfill, which has now been turned into our lovely center jewel, Winnequa Park. I would love to be able to see this land um, and this park be able to reflect some of the, the more distant heritage that we would like to be able to honor. Thank you. Uh, Nicole Gruder, Nicole. My name is Nicole Gruder. I've been on Shore Acres Road since uh, 2000. And I, we all know what an amazing opportunity this is. And I have, keep it very short and simple. I just implore the designers and all the people that are working so hard on this um, to just keep, uh, try to keep the asphalt and concrete to as minimal as possible. Once that's paved over, it's paved over for generations, and um, it's a space that's been, uh, it's, it's, there's a vibe there, right? There's an energy. That's why we are all attracted to it, and it has people who have been for centuries um, praying there, meditating there, gardening there, enjoying the nature, and there's a reason that it feels like it does, and a reason that it looks like it does, and it's not, and it's because it's not developed um, to such a high degree as many other parks are. So that's all. Um, I know that doesn't put money into everybody's pockets indefinitely and in the immediate future, but um, we, if we can think well beyond you know, this, the, the 2000s even, um, just for that tiny little sliver of a breath of fresh air that we get when we drive down Monona Drive. So thanks. Jack Schrader, Jack. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Jack Schrader. I've lived in Monona for 12 years. And I would like to express my gratitude for all of you on the stage for the efforts you're making to bring this together. Thanks sincerely. 
I first uh, went to Damiano in 2010. I was assigned as a census worker to <clears throat> visit the property and determine if there were residents and how many. Uh, confidentiality prevents me from telling you what I learned on that visit. But when I learned that the city had purchased the property last year, I started visiting in the evening, uh, especially for sunset. And I found something <clears throat> very valuable, very precious and rare. I found tranquility. And I'm here tonight to champion the cause of tranquility. Uh, my second concern is that uh, as much of the eventual property be accessible to the maximum degree as possible, which uh, kind of conflicts with my first stated concern. Uh, but I found last year that uh, it wasn't necessary to have solitude to find tranquility because the people I met there who had come down motivated as, as we were, uh, were gentle, friendly, uh, welcoming, and I would like to see us preserve that and encourage it as well as we can. Now, in reflecting on the need to keep tranquility or make tranquility a goal, uh, I realized that the traffic arriving and departing is disruptive. As, would, as it would be if there were uh, boats arriving and leaving uh, frequently and unpredictably. Uh, so it, it occurs to me that probably keeping parking near the road would be the best idea. Uh, and again, that may seem to conflict with accessibility because I would like to see as much of, of the property as possible available to uh, my friends who use wheelchairs. Uh, as far as some of the other uses proposed for the property, you know, it's possible to get beer all up and down Monona Drive <clears throat> and coffee and sandwiches, but it's very hard to find tranquility anywhere but at the park. <clears throat> uh, I wish you well, and I hope you find a judicious way to satisfy all of our needs to make the property as accessible to as many people as possible and to preserve the very wonderful things there that most make it a treasure. Thank you. John Shields. John Shield. Thank you, Jake. Um, I want to first of all thank the uh, master committee for doing such a masterful job wading through um, a thousand and one requests from individuals uh, as well as um, other people who um, perhaps operated businesses and who visit the property who revere the property as do you. And uh, question number 22 that was on the uh, screen in front of us uh, listed the wide, wide, wide variety of opportunities for the property. And um, my personal hope is that you won't get it too commercialized because uh, it is a, a sacred property to the Ho-Chunk people and uh, once, once the commercialization of the property uh, begins, you'll have to, as a committee, determine where that commercialization stops. So it's a fine line. And uh, we just, we thank you so much. I wanna thank uh, Jake Anderson and his city crew. It's, um, they have their hands full keeping track of 10, point plus acres, but uh, they've done a tremendous job and they're, they, the crew that you have, Jake, uh, they're very respectful 
They're very knowledgeable, they're very cordial, and we're, I'll tell you, as a community, all of us are grateful to have uh, Jake and his crew and this master committee um, in on the planning. So thank you very much. All right, Bill DeVillers. Hello all, and uh, thank you for coming out. It's good to see such a great turnout for something like this. I appreciate the committee up here. Uh, my name is Phil DeVillers. Um, many of you might have heard of me, but not have met me. Let me begin, I've got some prepared my remarks. I'd like to begin by reading a quote from Mayor O'Connor that reflects my vision of her vision of the San Diego pop property. Her quote, it is of utmost importance that the process of transforming San Damiano into an asset for Monona and the surrounding region be deliberate, thoughtful, and intentional, as well as sustainable in every sense of the word, the mayor said. What is, this is what a deliberate, thoughtful, and sustainable use of the San Damiano looks to me, like to me. A small boutique spa or hotel with a bar restaurant where the building sits now and a public pier like the UW Terrace, while preserving six to seven acres for green space, public access, or a park. This concept would make the property accessible to a huge portion of, of Monona. A significant number are over the age of 65. I think they're well represented here. Years ago, there was a spa hotel on the lake. It is marked with a plaque about 100 yards up the street from Schluter Beach. This is not a new concept. Uh, you might have known, uh, heard of Shake Shack, the first Shake Shack, there's now over 250 of them. The first Shake Shack was actually opened in Madison Square Park in New York City in July of 2004. Tavern on the Green has been an institution in Central Park in New York City since 1934 and has consistently been one of the top five grossing restaurants in the nation. Before we advance our, our vision for San Damiano as a collective community, I raise a critical question. How did we get here? On June 2nd, 2001, the city of Monona purchased the San Damiano property for $8.6 million. This increased the city debt load by 17% and had been approved by just seven people, the mayor and six alders. According to the city finance director, this obligation will cost the residents $29.13 per $100,000 of assessed property value or $104 a year on the average home valued in Monona. How much discussion was had concerning this financial burden and risk? When the alders and mayor decided to purchase the property for $8.6 million, the city's financial consultant, Jeff Bologna, said, quote, he was confident that the current plan will be fine. The city won't finance itself into a corner. Then he experienced an electrical blackout and wasn't heard from again. That's actually in the minutes to the meeting. The city used $2 million from the county in May of 2022 to pay down the debt. However, 5.9 million will have to be refinanced in May 2026, and it's currently costing the city $265,000 a year in principal and interest. In June 2021, the 10-year treasury rates were 1.5%. They are now nearing 4%. When the debt is refinanced, rates could be two to three times what they are now. In November 2018, Monona residents voted on a $57 million school referendum to build a new elementary school and addressed $10 million in Winnequa elementary school needs. Over 5,000 Monona residents voted, with 64% expressing uh, support. This school referendum cost less as a taxpayer than the purchase of the San Daniel property. Prior to the school referendum, we were invited to public meetings, provided informational flyers, architectural renderings, budgets, financial projections, slides. In short, loads of information was available for the residents to read, understand, and ask questions about, and then vote on. The city's obligation to purchase 10 acres of land for $8.6 million had none of this. Now a couple of quotes from the Wisconsin State Journal. This was from an article on March 13th of 2021. Two months before the Monona City Council voted unanimously to buy one of the last undeveloped pieces of land on Lake Monona, a consultant privately warned members that this was very unlikely the millions in private individual donations needed to fund the purchase could be raised anytime soon. Nancy Moore, a, Midi a Monona City
kahinaan. view any of the amenities outside you can do so as well but we also had uh, Kellen just for the record Kelsey Kerstead I need my readers Dolores Z and Owen de Villers have registered to speak but have bequeathed their time to fill so there you go from the Wisconsin State Journal um, continuing thank you Jake um, Nancy Moore, a Monona City Council member and champion of the project, introduced city officials to David Allen, whom she works with at a different consulting firm. But in a July 2020 report, David Allen, the consultant hired by the city, found it would be difficult to identify many deep-pocketed donors with enough affinity for the property to make major donations towards its purchase. Quote, can an adequate constituency of potential contributors be identified? David Allen asked, in a word, no. O'Connor and the City Council was briefed in a closed session on Allen's preliminary and final findings on August 17th and 18th, respectively, and they were only made public recently. This was back then. And the mayor said, it was not any deliberate decision not to make the report public earlier. I just think it got lost in the shuffle. Alderman Kathy Thomas said that given the community's interest in obtaining the land, we'd be fools not to buy it. I wholeheartedly agree with that. The worst case scenario is if the residents don't want to keep it as an open space, she said, we could control who the sold, we sold the property to and what kind of development went on it. Another quote from a Wisconsin State Journal in June 2nd of 2021. The city struck a deal last year to buy the San Damignano. Uh, it approved borrowing $8.5 million to purchase the property last month, but it is counting on money raised by the separate Friends of San Damignano group to pay much of that back. The city, which has been operating, has an operating budget this year of about 6.6 .6 million, appears sensitive to the need to raise outside money, noting in a statement that additional funds to bring down the overall cost to taxpayers are being sought through a variety of other avenues, including grants and private fundraising. Now, with that as a background, I leave you with these questions. How many people in this room know that the city has spent $509,000 to date on the Sam Damignano. Show of hands. Does it look any different after $509,000? How many people in the room know that the city has spent $509,000 to date on the Sam Damignano? Does it look any different? How many people in this room know how much Friends of San Damiano has raised, and then none of it has gone to offset the 509000 the city has paid to date. How is it that the Friends, Friends of San Damiano, a special interest group that will be lucky to raise 1% of the total cost of this project, get, get to dictate its development and use? Why is the mayor not following the city of Madison's example? They are having a Lake Monona waterfront design challenge with public event series. How much has been raised by the Friends of San Damignano? Why isn't this the first agenda item at the steering committee meeting? Why are they being so opaque? How much has the Friends of San Damignano contributed to offset expenses incurred by the city? Answer equals zero. What will the survey monkey be used for? How do we know who responded? The same people could have responded multiple times. How can this be relied upon in any way? Is this simply a check the box we asked for public input and got it exercise? Survey Monkey is good for fall chili cook-off and naming a, snow new, a snowman built in front of Winnequa Elementary. Not this. This should have been on the ballot for our upcoming November election as, as a referendum where 6,000 could vote and we'd know they were from Monona. How many people in this room know, know that more people live proximate to the San Damignano that are not actually in Monona? That being said, I would imagine everyone on the east side of Monona Drive, those living in Madison, are extremely supportive of it being a park. Also, how is the proposed $50 million public safety building going to be paid for? When the mayor ran for election, she stated that the Monona pool will have to be replaced as well. Where is all this money coming from? I agree with, I was bequeathed time by four other people. Uh, I agree with our gentleman that spoke first. It says the number, November 21st building condition report said the building is a total disaster and would like 
likely take three to six million dollars to reconstruct. And so what it, would, what it would be used for. Finally, I add this. I am very grateful that I live in Monona. I am very grateful that we have the number of parks that we do. Monona is actually just 2,100 acres with 23 parks totaling almost 400 acres in all. That's almost 20% of, of Monona city land is actually parks. That's good. All right. Last call. Anyone else would like to speak? John Traver. I came here tonight and I promised my wife I would keep my mouth shut, but after that last, after that last um, discussion, uh, I have to say something. This is, to me, this is, that last uh, speech was uh, deja vu to 30 years ago uh, when we uh, started an effort to preserve the Woodland Park property. Um, and at that time, people threw, said we couldn't do it. Uh, said this, the city shouldn't be doing it. They, they threw every um, <laughs> argument, uh, said the survey didn't. We at that time had a referendum. We got signatures uh, to support the purchase of the property. Um, uh, they said all our signatures were bogus. They said our, our um, uh, signatures were all from people from Madison. Um, this, I'm sorry, but th this was the same type of thing that we ran into back then. And I'll just point out that Woodland Park, um, that was 50 acres. Um, uh, didn't cost, obviously, as much as San Damiano, but this piece of property is a lot different than Woodland Park. It's on the lake. It's special. It's got a ton of history. Um, and um, 20 years later, that property is debt free. And we showed that if you develop that piece of property, and you can show um, with San Damiano too, that that's going to cost the city a lot of money in the long run. And the fact that, that that Woodland Park is now preserved is um, um, a real asset. And somebody said, once you pave it over, it's paved over. Um, and this property, in my opinion, does not have to be self-sustaining. Obviously, Woodland Park is not self-sustaining. It's an asset that the city can buy. I think there will be a lot of fundraising uh, to help in the purchase price of this. But in my opinion, you can't let this piece go. It's too special. Thank you. All right. I'm going to turn it back to Dan, Dan Williams. OK, thank you, Jake. And again, thank you uh, to everyone for your comments and coming out tonight. Um, we still have time. We're, we're here till 9 o'clock, and then that's a hard cutoff because we are in the school. Um, uh, we have the boards outside in the hallway with a couple questions. And if you have more comments, please write on notes and on those boards, and we'll, we'll document that for the, the master planning effort. So again, thank you for coming. And we'll see you again in February.